an Excel teacher here at the high school. Just to give you an idea of how things are going to run today, David's going to present his senior project, uh, during which time I ask that you give him your undivided attention. Uh, take a moment now to silence any cell phones or any electronic devices that may make noises during his presentation. Um, after he presents, we'll open it up to questions from the panel. Um, and then in the interest of time, if there is time, we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, after uh, the Q&A, we will have uh, David and his audience members leave the room, and then panel will deliberate. Uh, you have a couple forums in front of you. You have the rubric that we'll use to deliberate and determine what he receives for a grade. He is going for distinguished today, so keep that in mind as he presents. You also, panel members, have his senior project proposal in front of you. So what he does today in his presentation has to match his proposal. And then the last form you have is a warm and cool feedback form. So you feel free to use that to take notes, things you think he's doing well in the presentation, things you think he could improve upon. And also feel free to write on the back of any of those forms if you want to write notes or questions down for the Q&A. Um, after we determine uh, the grade he gets, We'll bring David back into the audience, and he, uh, back into the room, and he can bring back any audience members that he'd like to bring back in with him. We'll let him know how he did and give him his form of cool feedback. Any questions before we start? Okay, as soon as I sit down, so we can start. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Spencer, for the introduction. And hello, everybody, and welcome to my senior project. As I hope that you guys all know, I'm David Stansfield, and I chose to pursue stealth aircraft design and aerospace engineering as my topic of choice for my senior project. Now before I get started, I want to introduce my panel members, as well as my experts, who I interviewed throughout my process. So I'd like to introduce Ms. Hunter, who was my senior project advisor. I'm going to go a little out of order, because of order right here. Um, Mr. McCormick, who was my calculus teacher last year. Uh, Madame Osborne, who is a French teacher extraordinaire. And Billy Weber, who is my, not only my neighbor, all around great guy. So, now to go for my experts. Now, I personally interviewed both of my experts, had face-to-face -face interviews with them. And my first expert is Mr. Mark Focusato. He's an engineer at Bath, Bath Iron Works in Bath, Maine. And I came in contact with him through means of my blue and gold officer, who is my liaison officer for the Naval Academy. And Mr. Focusato did radar cross-section reduction work on the brand new stealth destroyer, the new DDG-1000 that you guys may have seen on the news a few weeks ago, it just debuted. And next, Mr. Philip Belanger. Now, Mr. Philip Belanger is an engineer at Pratt & Whitney. So he was my engine contact. Anything to do with engines, he was my guy. And I came in contact with him my freshman year when I job shadowed him for my freshman year experience. So now let's go to my essential question. This is the foundation of my research, and it reads, how has the innovation of stealth in aerospace engineering affected the performance of military aircraft in radar cross-section reduction? Kind of seems like an obscure question. So my inspiration was my interest in aviation. I want to become, I want to become a pilot, and I just, I love learning about airplanes. I, my friends probably think I talk like a little kid when I talk about them, because I just love them so much. And it goes back to the Blue Angels. I love watching the Blue Angels, whether that's on YouTube videos, whether that's in person. I find them so fascinating. And they've instilled this level of love for aviation in me and also this level of pride that says, yeah, I could potentially serve my country and that's why I'm a Naval Academy candidate. Also, I'm thinking about pursuing engineering as a major. And like I said, I have a love for aviation, so I want to become a pilot. So my future goal. Going into this project, I didn't know much about stealth, how they, how engineers could evaluate stealth, how it was done. But I did know that it was a strategy for three reasons. One, we want to disguise our aircraft so that they can go behind enemy lines and come back every time. We're sending multi-million multi, multi dollar jets behind enemy lines. We want the, that money to come back to us. Two, the safety reason. We send our men and women behind enemy lines into combat zones. We want them to come back safe and sound. And three, it's a war tactic. We want to get in, do what we need to do, and get out. So in my presentation, I'm going to discuss a few different things. I want to look at the origin of stealth, the history. I want to look at airframe, shaping, it, shaping aircraft, which is a key, which I'll talk about later on. I want to talk about radar-absorbent materials, RAM, 
as well as radar absorbent structures. And lastly, innovative feats. Now these innovative feats don't necessarily exist in the world today, but are different things that we could potentially research in the future for future applications. Now my research talks a lot about radar cross-section reduction. And in order to understand that, we first need to understand RADAR. It's actually an acronym. It stands for Radio Detection and Ranging. And it works as ECHO. Now I want you guys to picture yourself. You're standing in front of your bathroom mirror, all right? When you look into the mirror, you see yourself. Now why? Because you have a light source above you. That light source sends out light waves, which reflects off the mirror and into your eyes, and then you can see yourself. Well, radar acts much the same way, much like a light wave. So a radar, trans a radar transmitter sends out a radar wave, it reflects off of an object, it comes back to the receiver, and then you can see that object on a radar screen. It comes in many different frequencies. Now that can actually pose a challenge for engineers because different materials work better for different frequencies. Finally, before I actually get started on uh, more of my in-depth conversation, I want to talk a little bit about definitions. Stealth, what does it mean? Well, it means secret, not easily acknowledged. Low observability, that's kind of interchangeable with stealth. So think of that as the same exact word. And finally, the most important one, radar cross-section. Now, radar cross-section simply means the radar return of an object. I want to point your attention to this image right over here in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Now, as you can see, it has a bunch of different spikes because radar cross-section comes from radar return 360 degrees around the aircraft. And that circle represents 360 degrees. Now as you can see, it spikes. There's a, la there's a louder echo right here. There's a bigger reflection here and here. And that's because of a radar cross-section coefficient. Engineers used this com really complex equation to calculate RCS. I'm not gonna go into that because that was not the basis of my research and it would take forever to talk about and to understand. But it produces a number, and that number is the radar cross-section coefficient. As you can see here, it has a very small coefficient of about negative 10. Where it's here, it's much larger. So the idea is that we want to we want to have a very small radar cross-section coefficient in order for RCS and deflecting radar, because that's our goal in stealth, to be achieved. So let's go back to the early 1900s and World War I. Now, World War I was the first war that we are not only fighting on the ground, we're fighting in the air. But there's still a need for stealth. Radar, may, radar systems haven't emerged yet, but we still want to be stealthy. We did this through standard camouflage, and this was used by the German forces. Now, this camo, as demonstrated on the aircraft, is much like what you would see on military BDUs today, those uniforms, that type of camouflage, as well as what hunters would wear into a forest. You're trying to blend into your surroundings. So when you look up in the sky, you can't see the airplane. Now this all changed in the 1940s in the World War II era. In, World, in the World War II era, radar systems started to emerge. So now we're not only worried about visual detection, we can see an airplane from miles away, which isn't good for our own, our own factor. Now we have to address this through different means. First, the first uh, was uh, called a Salon A-State film, which worked much like a photography film, which they would cover an aircraft with. It didn't really work all that, all that well because it actually reflected sunlight better and it created less, stealth, less stealthy capabilities. And the next thing that we used was radar absorbing plywood. This was beneficial, beneficial to the aircraft designs of the, of the day. Lastly, I want to point out the German Horton HO229 flying wing, which is demonstrated here in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. And this was an experimental aircraft. It was the first of its kind. And there were two skeptics on this aircraft. One said that this was primarily designed for aerodynamics, while the other said that it was a key factor in deflecting radar. So as we come out of the 1940s, into the 1950s, jets start to emerge. Now in World War II, the main propulsion system for aircraft was propellers. But now we have jets, and jets are faster. They're bigger, they're better. Because now radar systems are starting to get, they're starting to have longer ranges, and they're getting bigger and better. So we have to compete with that. 
And the main way that we avoided these, this radar was to fly fast and to fly high to avoid it. We also jammed our enemy radar, which is simply uh, sort of like hacking it in order to take it offline for a minute, go in, do what you need to do, and get out. So that worked at the time, but as we'll see in the 1970s, well, radar systems are getting even better. So now flying high and flying fast isn't really going to work for us because, well, pretty soon we're going to end up in outer space. So the way to do this is through radar cross-section reduction in stealth. Now we can fly at lower altitudes and still achieve the same goal. And this is done primarily through the airframe. And I want to read this quote, which is actually taken from this book, Skunk Works. And Skunk Works was written by a former director of the stealth division of the Lockheed Martin Aircraft Company. And it reads, 65% of low radar cross-section comes from shaping an airplane, 35% from radar absorbent coatings, and the SR-71 was about 100 times stealthier than the Navy's F-14 Tomcat fighter built 10 years later, and that's due to airframe uh, design. So the key point here is that airframe is extremely important. Now to go off of that, in my interview with Mr. Focusado, my number one takeaway and his number one rule was to internalize anything and everything that you can inside the aircraft. That means weapons, internal weapon bays, as well as any antennas on the outside of the airplane that could um, call for any sort of radar return that you don't want. Next, I want to talk a little bit about conventional versus stealth. So if you look up in the right hand corner of the screen, you'll see a pretty typical airliner. And then I want to draw your attention to this right here, which also comes from the Naval Post Graduate School. And it says that the complex shape of any ordinary aircraft reveals many surfaces that can reflect incoming signals back to the radar, including air inlets, compressor blades, vertical stabilizers, external payloads, all cockpit instruments, all 44 cavities, which are discontinuities on the airplane, and corners. So conventional versus stealth, which we talk about here. Engine fans, and this is the engine right here. On a conventional aircraft, those engines are mounted right off the wing because the engines like to take in fresh, cool air that's directly accessible to them. But that doesn't really fly for stealth aircraft, and the reason being is that those compressor blades, those big fans, act as a huge radar magnet. So how do we avoid that? Well, let's, as Mr. Belander said, let's bury them in the airframe. Let's put them inside the aircraft so now radar cannot find it. It's hard for it to access to those fans, and therefore you don't get the return. Next, I want to talk about vertical stabilizers. Now, the vertical stabilizer is right here. As you can see, that's a big surface. Also, it creates a 90 degree angle with the airframe. And 90 degree angles in the, in the stealth world, it doesn't fly. And the reason why is because a 90 degree angle will send radar right back to where it came from. So if you look at the F-22 and in the stealth realm, those big vertical stabilizers are tilted. They're on an axis. And the reason for doing that is so now the radar can be deflected away from the aircraft instead of being sent right back to the receiver. Lastly, I want to talk about spike assignment. And this is actually a good diagram of spike assignment right here. And what spike assignment says is that now engineers can pick and choose very small angles in order to have large echo or large reflection at those very minute angles. Now, why would we want to have a large echo at a small angle? Well, the reason for it is so that radar, radar transmitters would have to be at that very specific angle in order to see a loud return or a big reflection uh, from that aircraft, which is very beneficial in stealth aviation. To continue on with the airframe, the sawtooth shape, which can be seen up in the upper right-hand corner, versus a straight line. The sawtooth shape can take, this, can take the place of a straight line. The reason being, the straight line creates that 90-degree angle and sends, it, sends the radar right back to the receiver, whereas the sawtooth shape will actually deflect it, as seen here. Lastly, continuous surfaces. I'm actually going to go back to the slide before, and I want to point out something on this air, on the airliner right here. Now, there's a gap between the engine and the airframe. And gaps like that, when radar comes in, radar can bounce back and forth, and then you don't control it anymore. But if you look at the F-22 blueprint here, you go from the nose 
it segues right into the air inlet and right into the wing. It's a very continuous surface and there aren't gaps. And that, is, that lack of gaps, those lack of gaps, may have, make sure, ensures that the engineer knows exactly where the radar is going. Some of you guys know a little bit about airframe. Let's talk about application. And to do that, I want to go back to the 1970s and the Lockheed Martin Aircraft Company. In the 1970s, the CIA came in contact with a paper written by the Soviets. In this paper, it, it illustrated how to calculate radar cross-section on a two-dimensional surface. So we took that paper and we said, well, this could be beneficial to us. There's a greater need for stealth. As I said earlier, radar is becoming more advanced. And if we keep flying higher and we keep flying faster, well, we're just going to end up higher and farther away from the target. But with this new Soviet paper, with all this information, we can take it, and we did it through a process called fastening, which is, as it's shown here on the F-117, if you notice, the very triangular and the diamond shape, uh, it's got a very triangular appearance to it, very unconventional look. And that's fastening, is now we're taking those two-dimensional surfaces, and we're able to engineer an airframe at different angles that can reflect radar, as seen here, away from radar transmitter and receivers. And this is very beneficial because the F-117 looks like a hummingbird on radar screens. Now to show you what a hummingbird looks like, I want to point your attention to this big diagram over here. That's a B-52 bomber. And it has a very conventional presence to it. The engines are out on the wings, it's got a vertical stabilizer, and this is what it looks like on a radar screen. But if we go to the bottom here, the F-117, that's what it looks like. Very small. Now let's go to the 1980s and the Northrop Company, the B-2 Spirit. Now the engineers over at Northrop said, all right, well, we want to take something called the flat plate theory. And the flat plate theory says that something without dimension, well, radar can't reflect off something without dimension. So they wanted to build a flying wing to kind of model that. And as computers emerge, now we can build bigger and more aerodynamic aircraft. Now before I continue, I'm going to draw attention to my quote at the bottom, which was taken from a woman named Rebecca Grant, and Grant wrote a PDF document about the entire design process of the B-2 Spirit. And it reads, the law that Stan, a Northrop engineer, came up with, says you are going to get spikes from the straight edges. The corollary says, if you curve, you eliminate spikes, but the RCS grows where you curve. You can't get rid of RCS, all you can do is push it and pull it around like a balloon. Now I think that this is really important because it says that yeah, true stealth doesn't and invisibility doesn't exist. But we can be smart about it. So we're gonna curve our surfaces because building an aircraft we need it to have dimension. It's an object. So we're gonna curve it and eliminate unnecessary radar return. Another thing is those narrow spikes. This aircraft is only loud. It only has a big reflection at very minute angles. And those angles are the angle of this wing and the angle of this wing, as well as these two angles right here. So it only spikes at very minute angles. Now let's go to the modern day in the F-22. This is one of my favorite planes. And the F-22 has the RCS of a bird. And as we saw on the diagram a few slides back, that's very, very small. How did we do this? How did we design an aerodynamic, well-performing aircraft that looks like that? Well, computer advancements. We're getting bigger and we're getting better. We can, dis we can now engineer a more aerodynamic, circular airframe while still maintaining very specific angles on that air airframe to re deflect radar off of. From the front, the F-22 actually has a very triangular appearance to it, which if we saw back on the slide with the F-117 is beneficial in deflecting the radar here and there. So it has carefully designed surfaces. It also utilizes the sawtooth W shape on hatches right in here and on the front of the cockpit cover. And that sawtooth shape, as I described earlier, just simply deflects the radar. It takes the place of that straight line. Lastly, spike symmetry. Now we talked a little bit about spike symmetry and you can see that here where all of these lines all go to the same angle. So any radar that deflects off the airframe here, here, or here, or here, or here, is all going to go back to the same exact angle, which is very, very beneficial. Now, 
talked a little bit about the F-22, now I kind of want to show you the F-22. And this video has some great images, broad images, of the aircraft. Take a minute, but I really want to show you guys the takeoff roll of the airplane because this is going to demonstrate the raw power that this, this airplane that's very stealthy has, the capabilities that it has. You can kind of hear the power too in the jet engine. And fun fact, when I went to Pratt & Whitney, Pratt & Whitney actually designs and manufactures the engines that go into the F-22, so I saw I saw a model that was actual, that was an F-16 engine, but I got to see a little, some diagrams, some components to the F-22 engine as well. you guys to think of a cake, all right? I want you guys to think that the airframe is the cake. It's the foundation. Without the airframe, you don't have a cake, all right? We don't have an airplane either. And the radar absorbent materials are sort of like the frosting. It's like the happy birthday writing on there. It <laughs> makes the cake that much better. It works in two primary methods. Conversion. Converting the radar uh, energy to other forms, such as heat. Another way to do it is through destructive interference, which just means simply basically killing the radar, canceling it out. Composites are also, very use, are, also, are also a very useful material because they're non-metallic, which means that they have poor reflective capabilities, so they don't reflect radar. Another thing that they're useful for is insulation. They can absorb. Now this is called the Salisbury screw. Now this is one element that a material could have, and it's broken up into a resistive screen and a reflected backplate. And the difference in the width between that screen and the backplate is one fourth of the wavelength here apart. Now the blue line right here illustrates the incident wave, the incoming radar. And when it hits that resistive screen, some of the energy is, deflected, is reflected away, illustrated by the purple line. Some of it is absorbed. And then it's reflected off that backplate. Now when that happens, because the distance between the screen and the backplate is one-fourth of that wavelength, they then become opposite one another and cancel each other out. It's called passive cancellation. The only drawback to this is that it only is useful for specific frequencies. So if, you're, if you go into a war zone that you're using a specific frequency for, for the Salisbury screen, and then you're working against a different frequency, it can actually make your air, aircraft more visible. Regardless, it is useful. Next, I want to talk a little bit about radar absorbent coatings, paint. And to do this, I want to show an example, a research, some research that I found on the Marvel database. And it was a tri-layer paint coating for submarine use. Now, although it was for submarines, these can be interchangeable with aircraft. Now, the first layer was a corrosive, was a corrosion protectant. It that went directly on the metal, metallic airframe. The second layer was a magnetic absorption filler. This is where all the work does with canceling and converting that radar and reducing the radar cross-section coefficient. 
And lastly, the third layer was a paint coating against water damage and any kind of damage, much like you have paint on your car. You can see the paint on my aircraft over here, that gray color. But the most important part of this paint, of this specific research, was the coefficient, negative 10. As I described earlier, you want as small as, of, as small of a coefficient as possible. And that fits the bill. Next, I want to talk about radar absorbent structures. Again, these are the details on the cake. It's making your plane that much better. It's, it's allowing you to be, have or acquire a much smaller radar cross-section coefficient. First, the honeycomb structure. And that's seen in the upper right-hand corner. Now, the honeycomb structure is a bunch of hexagonal passages that are on top of one another. Now, as you near the core of that structure, the radar absorbent material becomes much more dense. So as the incident wave comes in, it, some of it gets reflected and some of it gets absorbed. And at each layer, it keeps getting reflected and absorbed, reflected and absorbed. And as you near that center, that energy is being diminished, thus trapping radar. Much the same in the V-shaped design, which is illustrated here. The incident wave comes in and it bounces back and forth. Now the absorbent material becomes much greater down near the core. So you're also diminishing and trapping radar. And lastly, like we talked about, sawtooth, the W shape. You want to scatter the radar away from the receiver. You don't want it to go right back. So in my research, and in the Naval Postgraduate School, I actually encountered some potential methods. And these are those innovative feats I talked about in my table of contents. These don't necessarily exist to our knowledge today, but there are potential research methods that we could look for in the future for future application. Now, I talked a little bit about passive cancellation with the Salisbury screen. Now I want to talk about active cancellation in the form of avionics and computers, onboard computers, which is demonstrated here. And the way that passive cancellation works is that the computer, it will calculate an incoming radar wave, it will match the frequency of that wave, and it will transmit that counter wave at the precise angle it came, the incident wave came at, thus canceling it out. Now this is very beneficial because you could technically make an airplane invisible if it could cancel any and all radar coming at it. Next I want to talk a little bit about plasma stuff. And yeah, plasma, just like a plasma TV, pretty cool. And all plasma really is, is it's a ionized gaseous field that's electrically conductive. And it's useful because when radar goes through that gaseous field, its electrons can actually become ionized and, it, and the radar can be converted to other forms such as heat. Russian scientists have shown that plasma stealth can actually reduce ra radar cross-section by 100-fold, which is huge. But there are four drawbacks. One of the drawbacks includes that it only works at specific frequencies. Okay. The next one is that it can actually emit a glow around the aircraft, which kind of defeats the purpose of stealth if you're trying to be unseen. Another thing is that it can produce an ionized trail, visible trail behind the aircraft, not beneficial for stealth. And four, well, scientists really haven't discovered a way to encompass a whole airplane with plasma, so we're working on it. So I just spit out a bunch of information at you. You're probably wondering, well, what do I do with this? Well, what did I learn? What did I take a book? So what? Well, I want to wait here, draw your attention to that question. What didn't I learn? I learned just about everything in this presentation. When I talked about my prior knowledge side, I said that all I really knew was the strategies for stealth. I didn't know how it was done. I didn't know how engineers could develop aircraft in order to evade radar systems. So this was all new to me. That brings me back to my essential question. How has the innovation of stealth in aerospace engineering affected the performance of military aircraft in radar cross-section reduction? Well, engineers can mold airframes. They can create airframes, as we discussed, that can deflect radar away from the uh, receivers. And then to make it a little better, we can manipulate that airframe by adding the radar absorbent materials and the radar absorbent structures in order, for to, in order to produce an aircraft that disguises itself, like I said, to look like a bird. Stealth is a game changer, and it allows us to aim high, 
fly, fight, and win. Anywhere, anytime. So where do I see myself going with this? Well, my post-secondary connection. Like I said before, engineering. This is what I want to major in. It's where I want to go with my career. But more importantly, I want to become a pilot. And this goes right back to that love for aviation. I'm also a Naval Academy candidate, which is really important to me. And this goes right along with the stealth, the defense system. I'm looking at potentially flying stealth aircraft in the future. So learning about them was interesting and beneficial for that. And lastly, I want to be a commercial pilot at some point in my life. And stealth is kind of just that really cool commercial pilot and it's taken it to the next level. So at this time, I want to thank you all for coming. And I'd like to open it up to questions. When you do go to the Naval Academy, do you, when do you start flying? When does that happen in the whole process? So the Naval Academy, it's much like, well, their motto is not college. And it's not college, but it is a post-secondary uh, education facility. So I would go there for four years. I would study, I want to study aerospace, mechanical engineering. So I would study that for four years. I would then receive my commission. I would be commissioned an ensign in the Navy. And then I would be transferred to Pensacola, Florida, where I would be trained to fly. After that, I would be in the service for about eight years, and I'd be flying joint strike fighter missions. I'd be stationed on aircraft carriers and all that fun stuff that comes with military life. Um, my question, you mentioned a couple times the Russians. The Russians. And uh, you mentioned that we had intercepted that document of theirs. And then I think you said something about when you're talking about the newer technologies, you mentioned Russian scientists. So it made me think, are they the leaders in this field, or are we the leaders? Like, who is doing this the best? Who's doing this and the I, best? And I don't know if you have an answer for that, or, you know, can you talk about, are, are, is there still that aviation race? Like, are we still in, you know, competition? I think there will always be a race. I mean, if somebody else comes out with a better technology, you're going to want to compete with that. Right. In fact, I think we're a leader because of the F-22. It's considered the most feared aircraft in the world today. Mm -hmm. um, I told you a story today where a few Russian MiGs, Russian MiGs, that's actually, goes right into your question, and they were coming a little too close to comfort to our shoreline. So we put up a few F-22s to kind of see what they were doing, what they were up to. They had no idea we were there until we verbally communicated. My grandfather told me that story. So I think that we are at, at the top with the F-22 and its stealth capabilities as well as maneuverability. Mm -hmm. But I also read an article and I uh, didn't incorporate it because I didn't find it is as important. But this goes back to the political set side, side of the stealth aspect and the fact that other countries are starting to develop stealth warplanes to compete with mm -hmm. ours. Mm -hmm. So I would say that at the time, we got it from the Soviets, but mm -hmm. I think that we're at the top now, mm -hmm. and I think that it's just gonna be ever, an ever-changing race mm -hmm. where, I mean, if you look back to the 50s and 60s, the communist race and the arms race, mm -hmm. um, we're just trying to be one step ahead. getting ready to like sit up and, and put my pen to paper and you turn the corner and, and answer the question that I was about to write down. I, I'm kind of at a loss right now. <laughs> I'll ask you a personal question then. Okay. Okay, so we were driving by Pratt & Whitney years ago and my daughter was three and she said, Mom, is that heaven? And I said, 
no. Um, so for you being a lover of aviation and playing, going into Pratt & Whitney, was, what was that like for you? Your daughter's right, it was heaven. <laughs> No, I love going there. I mean, it's like a, it's like an indoor city in there. They've got forklifts. Like every time, there's stop signs on the floor. You're walking around and you have to stop, or you'll get hit by a forklift. I mean, there's machines everywhere, and it was really cool to actually tour it with the engineer and to see what they do and to see the engineering facilities. I really enjoyed it because it was right up my alley. Very secure there, though. I walked in. Didn't know what to do. There's a phone on the wall and it says there's a sign that says. Take it up. <laughs> All right, the receptionist says, well, what are you doing here? And then you can go in, why don't you do that? So it's very secure, so it was really cool to get that insider point of view from there. So yeah, it was heaven. It's all worth that. <laughs> Zoe, do you have a question? I have one more. Um, what was the most valuable or interesting source that you that you read um, that you um, couldn't have done without or that you that you really enjoyed reading? Enjoyed reading? No, I'm just maybe they're Maybe they're different. Maybe kidding. they're two different. No, things. I really enjoyed reading the Naval Postgraduate um, School, the, uh, that full article. That was the foundation of everything. Without it, I don't think I would have had any idea what I was learning about. It set everything up from you know, innovative feats that that I talked about in the future, it went back to passive, active cancellation, airframe, and then because I needed other sources as well, I looked around in other places, but that's where I went, that's where I went to. The other thing that I really enjoyed was the experiences that I got. I've never traveled so much in a single semester. I went to, for different reasons, like for the Naval Academy, I went to Cape Elizabeth for an interview, for mm -hmm. this project, I went to Bath and to Pratt and Whitney. So really valuable experiences overall, but for that, for the source that I used, I'd have to say it was Siddhar's paper. Great. On the Naval Postgraduate School. Can you speak to the value, the academic value of a semester really digging in deep to a technical sort of topic like this? I mean, you were challenged to read things that um, were mathematically challenging, that were just conceptually, physically challenging. Speak to kind of coming out of the experience where you're at versus where you started in September, and how maybe that will affect your level of confidence heading into the Naval Academy next year. Well, one thing that I would completely suggest, and actually Jake and I were talking about this today, you've got to pick something that you love. Mm -hmm. If you do not, you will not love it. There are a few times when I was reading these papers, and I'm like, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to present this for 30 minutes. I, there's no way I can do this. And I thought about starting from scratch at some points. But the value in it is that if you pick something that you love and you learn more about it, whether you know it or not, you're gonna be one step ahead of the game for next year. The value in really digging deep and understanding why you like to research something or maybe going even a different direction. Like I said, I just like looking at pictures of planes. But then I said, well, how, how are they stealthy? What makes them so important? Kind of going at a different angle from it will make you much more versatile in the future. So I think there's value in seeing the different directions for what that topic can, where that topic can go. And I also think it's important that you also strengthen other uh, skills, such as like synthesis. Synthesis is very hard, and it's, this is based off of synthesis and taking your sources and combining them together and all that fun stuff. And so. Um, other skills like that, there's a lot of value in this. Does that help answer your question a little bit? Mm -hmm.